preacher? I messed up. First of all, I let the preacher take me to a steakhouse at 5 o'clock. And I thought I was doing good. I skipped Flo's Filet to a hamburger steak. And it got out okay, but then I came over here and saw all that chocolate cereal. I mean, I'm burping coming in the driveway, but I saw that chocolate cereal. Who could turn chocolate cereal down? I had a, I had a big old bowl of chocolate cereal. So as Sammy Allen's crowd would say, the Lord told me, the Lord told me you're supposed to preach tonight. But I'm still supposed to get my love off him, but you're supposed to preach. That's what the Lord told me. Praise God. All right. You know, I'm always happy to be here. I tell you the same story every time I come here. I know the preacher since uh, Abraham Lincoln was the president. Remember that? As we've been coming here forever. So you know, there aren't very many relationships like that you could keep because churches are changing so much and preachers are bailing out. A good preacher friend of mine, 50 years old, just died of stage 4 colon cancer the other day in Ohio. And, you know, they, they die. They... Um, get out of the ministry, they mess their life up, they compromise. And so this is a strong church. And I hope you ladies know that the pastor's wife is the key to the church. You understand that? All right. She told me to say that tonight. No, she didn't. Look, the pastor and I married up so high, we both had nosebleeds on our honeymoon. Say amen right there. All right. Where was that guy at? Who was the guy playing basketball? We, I said, I told, I, I told, I saw that guy try to take a sh jump shot. He missed everything. I told him to keep his day job. But he seems like a nice guy. He seems like a nice guy. That, that's who? Praise God. All right. Does anybody want to hear a new Italian joke? I got a new one. All right. You got, you got Punk Sahani Phil up in uh, Pennsylvania. The groundhog, right? And he comes out in the spring. If they see a shadow, there's six more weeks of winter, right? Well, there's an Italian groundhog downstate in Philadelphia. His name is Sonny Bruno. And uh, this, is, this is a true story. And they asked him if he saw his shadow. You know what he said? Yeah, I didn't see nothing. All right, Bob. All right. You'll, some of you will get that by slow freight next week. I, I should tell you this. I was in Canada a couple months ago in Montreal, and the pastor is a converted drug dealer. It's Peter Kyriopoulos, a Greek dude. His nickname before he got saved was Pitchfork Peter because he had all the Haitians trying to steal his drugs, and he'd fight them off with a pitchfork. But the Lord saved him and then uh, built a great church up there. But everything reproduces after its own kind. So he's got two converted gangsters sitting right off to my right over here. Two Italian Catholics got saved. And one of them's a, a real made man in Montreal. The other one's just a heroin pusher. So I felt led to tell Pollock jokes that night. Say amen right there. <laughs> but not really. <laughs> so I, 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 uh, I said, you know what's a good four-letter Italian word for goodbye? And, uh, you know, everybody thinks chow, you know. But the punchline of the joke is bang. Say amen right there. <laughs> Show you how crazy these two guys are. Pastor told me after the service, the one guy came up to him and said, you know, that Brother Grady's a cool guy, but he had that punchline all messed up. Now, what he told, what he said next, he wasn't trying to be funny. That's the funny part of the story. He's just trying to contribute something he knows about, you know, to, you know, to contribute something to the conversation. He says, it's never bang, preacher. It's always bang, bang, minimum, sometimes bang, bang, bang even, you know. <laughs> but the preacher said the other one was crazier than the first guy. The preacher told me about the other guy like a month or so before I got up there. He's uh, trying to teach him about the Old Testament. He's a two ex-Catholic Italians. They never saw a Catholic Bible. So he's telling them about the Old Testament priest cutting up the animals for sacrifice and the blood splattering on the vestments. I don't know what verse he got for that, but that's probably understood that that would happen, right? So he's telling that to the other dude. And the other guy says, well, preacher, that's, uh, that's why we always uh, use plastic. Uh, you'll get that. You'll get that by slow freight. All right, Matthew 21. Matthew 21. The preacher said you got some new people coming and going here, especially among the young people. So uh, be sure to go over to my little book table if you don't have my books. These books are kind of discounted when I show up here. Three of those books are $30 on my website. They're 20 here or three for 50 
and my Perilous Times book that's new is over there. Uh, I take debit cards, uh, Rolexes, uh, bad checks, anything you got, we'll, we'll talk about it in the lobby. But um, here's the best news I got for you. Best news. Uh, my new book just came out. Here it is. We got 11,000. This is the smallest thing I've ever written. Look. This is for unsaved people. This is for you to buy and to give to your lost loved ones, people that you know that will trust you a little bit. They may even read it under the blankets with a flashlight, but they're going to read it. It's called What Must I Do to Be Saved? Same artist that painted the Perilous Times cover, the shipwreck at Acts 27, painted this. It's the Philippian jailer with Paul and Silas. And this is a $2,700 commission painting, and uh, it's unbelievable in its detail. There's the gate hanging off the hinge from the earthquake. There's cracks running up the steps. Here's Paul's ankles all bruised up. That jail is about as burned out looking as a guy can be. This will make a nice impression the first person you'll give it to. <clears throat> but uh, I'll tell you real quick, pastors, are, I'm not trying to sell them now. They're not even on my book table. The preacher bought a case for you folks to have access to it for Easter Resurrection Sunday. But um, it's three books in one. My part of this book is only 65 pages. This is 144 pages. Only 65 pages is me. You don't drop a 900-page book on a lost dude. So here's, uh, here's the end of the book right here. Chapter 10, it ends on page 63, see? You turn the page, and what do you think you're looking at? Look, there's John chapter 1. Got a John and Romans at the back. And it's got a QR code on the front so you can scan it and listen to it. I'm so stupid. I'm 71 stinking years old. I, can, I have no technical skills. I have never scanned the QR code yet. I could not even know how to do that on my book. My wife was showing me yesterday how to do it. But for the yuppies you know that, that do that stuff, they can listen to the 10 chapters. I read them, and that comes with the book. So by the bottom line, you ought to be getting real excited about distributing these. Watch it. We had 11,000 show up for our first printing Friday. 6,000 went out Monday and Tuesday. Pre-sold already. We had more than half the printing sold before the books got here. That's how big the demand is right now for this. <clears throat> so uh, you want to be getting psyched up about it. Uh, I don't know if the preacher is going to jack the price up to make a big killing on you or not, but uh, it o it's only $360 for a box of 60. First, the first customer I had was a stay-at-home school mother in North Carolina, a lady named Carol, bought a whole case herself, $360. So uh, it only works out to about $5.97 a book, six bucks, you know, for 360, for 60 books in a box. Box is right under the uh, chairs over there if somebody wants to steal it on the way out the, the, the building today. Capiche? So you'd be praying about that. We're going to get some people saved with this thing, okay? All right, so much for all that. All right, you got your Bible open to Matthew 21. We're closing in on the, uh, well... Resurrection Sunday, I, uh, one of my little Facebook posts that I put out, I said, let me help you get your loved ones saved so we can change their focus from Easter Sunday to Resurrection Sunday. And so that's the cool timing of this thing coming out. Okay? All right. So uh, we're going to have uh, Easter season as the world sees it is upon us. So I'm going to give you a, a, a message connected with that time of the year. If you got your Bible open, why don't we stand for the reading of God's Word? And it's a blessing to see this many young people here, big time. How many of you teenagers know why Italians wear gold chains all the time? Have you ever seen an Italian? Raise your hand. You think you have a friend that's one? Let me tell you how you can know. He's got a short neck if he's Italian. That's right. They're always in front of the judge. I never heard of the guy. I know nothing about that guy. You know why Italians don't like to wear gold chains? Why they wear gold chains? Because they um, got to know where to stop shaving. All right, Matthew 21. Let's start reading here at verse 1. <clears throat> and when they preach, I really remind everybody the typical camp meeting preacher you're going to get in here, right? <laughs> Praise God. How many of you know what this is? That's a priest who stutters. All right, already. How many of you know what this is? 
Huh? That's the Pope at the rapture. All right. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Hallelujah. Matthew 21, verse 1. How you doing, kid? Verse 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethpage, <clears throat> unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And um, verse 6, And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way, put them on the ground for the animals to walk on. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for a strong church that's been staying by the stuff all these years and, and not cutting their convictions and their uh, beliefs and yet growing a, a group of young people especially. What a good testimony. And Father, I pray that you'll let, let me be a blessing to all the folks here, especially these two uh, new uh, converts. Uh, tonight that stood up and testified. Help me to be a blessing to everyone now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I, uh, I got uh, this, this story. It's so important. It's in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's called Various Things, uh, the King's Triumphant Entry, the King's Public Offer of Himself as King. That's Jesus coming into Jerusalem as the King of the Jews. He's riding on the foal. That's the, uh, the baby, the, the, the young, that's my Biden impersonation if I forget to tell you. If I start stuttering up here. If I fall up a flight of steps, that's another Biden impersonation. But um, this is a known uh, in, in the Catholic world, at least, and all of you have heard the expression, Palm Sunday. And so um, I got saved in 1974, 50 years ago this August I got saved through a radio ministry of Clarence Larkin's home church. And by the way, the church I pastored in Michigan was so crazy, that's my second church, the men in my church would not accept my testimony, General Motors country, because I was driving a Toyota in the Philadelphia traffic the first time I heard the gospel. They didn't think God could use a Toyota speaker. Say amen right there. Pretty crazy. But I, uh, 50 years ago this month, March 1974, I remember when it was, closing in on Easter, and I thought it was spooky. I was maybe more interested in listening. And you get some people to come to church on Resurrection Sunday, the lost, and use those books. Tell them you got a free book if they'll show up. But anyway, long story short, I was dating my, my wife at that time, my fiance. She was in nursing college in Milford, Delaware. And uh, on Sundays, I'm, five days a week, I'm listening to this preacher on the radio and just driving to work, strict, strong Roman Catholic, but I didn't see a Bible in a Catholic church. So I'm curious. But long story short, I, um, I, I, on Sundays, I would go visit my, uh, my wife in the, to be. She was in nursing college. We'd spend the day on the campus watching television, shooting pool, and, and so forth. But, uh, and then I'd drive back to Philadelphia and to go to work next the rest of the week listening to the preacher on the radio. But uh, I was getting under conviction so much, uh, I remember it was in March, 
right up right before Easter, what they what they call Palm Sunday, what we're talking about here in the Catholic Church. And I dragged my wife into the local Catholic Church where her nursing school was, Milford, Delaware. She's a saved Southern Baptist. She uh, shouldn't have been dating a Catholic, but my personality was overwhelming. It was. I couldn't help it. And uh, she wasn't real spiritual. She got saved when she was seven and, and, mom, and baptized in a creek. Mom and dad got divorced when she was nine, so she never got grounded in church. But I dragged her into a Catholic church for Palm Sunday. And the priest had, a, had the ushers pass out palms, straw, whatever the snot it is, right? And you know, down the aisle, everybody got a piece of a straw. Oh, this is going to be wild. And then we went outside and followed the priest. He, you know, he, he made a procession around the building. St. John the Apostle, Roman Catholic Church, Milford, Delaware. I wrote that. So there's the priest holding up a big bunch of straw in his hand, and everybody's coming in behind him, single file, and we're going around the building. And to me, I was a lost guy. That, that was cooler than a normal service. And I'm looking at my Southern Baptist wife thinking she's going to be all psyched up. She's looking at me like a deer, with, you look, uh, I mean, a, a calf looking at a new gate, like, are you crazy? What is, what's this, all this about? But aren't you getting something out of this? She was saved, even though she wasn't so spiritual yet, but she knew that was stupid, but I thought that was really cool. But uh, three, four months later, I got saved, and that was the last Palm Sunday service I ever had. Now, let me tell you something. There are some unbelievably beautiful things in this story here, and I'm going somewhere. When we finish up, we're going to take off. Is that all right? You bring an evangelist in? He's always got to have something unusual. No pastor can out-preach an evangelist. How many times have I told you that over the years? He's coming up with four messages every week for you. We're coming in with handkerchiefs, cufflinks, and about 12 sermons. And, they, and they've been tweaked forever. Am I right? Do you understand what I just told you? Every time I tell you this, I do the same thing. Remember? Was there anything else, preacher? How many times have you seen me do that? They're dead tonight, Lord. Was it too much? They eat too much cereal? They need another Italian joke. Um, okay, how many of you know why Italians hate Jehovah's Witnesses? You ought to remember some of these jokes. Huh? They hate all witnesses. All right. All right. Praise God. Now look at verse 3 here, chapter 21, verse 3. Here's a great practical application. Why is Jesus sending these disciples to go pick up these two animals? It's a mother mule, a donkey and a little foal, a little colt. The baby, the baby ass, as it's called here, because he's going to ride on the little baby when he comes into Jerusalem. Now watch verse 3. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. Now listen now, you're going to really learn something. This little donkey that they're going to bring to Jesus is a picture of you and me. The Lord has need of them. You know God, the creator of the universe, has need of all of us in here? We were all created to do something for Him. Now listen, there's two things you were created for. To do something for Him with your life. And number two, to fellowship with Him I saw on your van out there, right? Faith, family, fellowship, and uh, what was the other? Friendship? Yeah, fellowship. That's with one another. But how about you and God? You know the most important thing you'll ever learn, if you ever learn something in church? Every one of you was created by God, uniquely different from everybody else in the world. You No two snowflakes, no two blades of grass, no two uh, grades of sand. You hear all that stuff all the time. Well, why can't you get it in your head? No two people are the same. Right. What does that mean? That means when you talk to God when you're all by yourself, you tell Him you love Him, you tell Him how wonderful He is, you praise Him, you start growing up spiritually and doing the things you should do, you're fellowshipping with God. Yeah. What do you tell a girlfriend if you're dating some girl? You tell her how pretty she looks and how much you, pre you appreciate her maybe? Well, you can't do that with God. But here's the point. You may not know this now. It takes time to learn this. But when you're telling God all that stuff, you're telling God all that stuff with a personality, a spiritual personality that he has put into you. In other words, when you talk to him, you talk to him different the way anybody else talks to him. And, and he made you to talk to him like that. And he loves that. He can't get enough of that. 
Nobody can minister to God the way you can because God made you unique. Excuse me for breathing. Lifting up, what's Timothy tell you when you're praying? Lifting up holy what? Holy hands. Look. No two fingerprints are the same. Lord, it's me. Sometimes if I've been up and down with the Lord that week, you know, hot and cold, you know what I'll do sometimes? Hey, Lord, it's me, bipolar Bill. <laughs> so that's stupid. Yeah, but the Lord likes that. He thinks that's funny. He made me that way. We're designers' models. God's got a purpose for your life. If you miss it, listen, I'm, I got saved 50 years ago this coming August. I've been at this 50 years. I know some stuff by now. The reason I'm still at it is I can't get enough of it in my system. And guess what I've learned? The most important thing in my life after getting saved, the most valuable thing in my life, you know what it is, Liz? Purpose. Purpose. I have a purpose in my life. I don't, I don't live on the stupid telephones all day. All right, blah, blah, blah. Let me show you. I, I told you, I told you, turn, turn to Exodus 13. I told you that that uh, animal yielding to the person that went to go get him, he allowed himself to be brought to Jesus, right? And no one ever sat on him before. Now that's a picture of you and me before we were saved. God uses a donkey, a jackass to use as an illustration of what we are before we've been saved. Some of you young people down here, you, you may not be saved yet. You're coming here, well, you're just an old donkey. But the ones that got saved, we were donkeys too before we were saved. Now look, the number 13 is the number for rebellion. You ought to know that. Uh, young people, uh, look at verse 13. You're in Exodus 13, now you go to verse 13. And every, again, 13 is the number for rebellion. Hey, look, the Lord prompted me twice to show this to you because you're teenagers, you're just getting started in your Bibles. Turn to Genesis 1 real quick. I want to show you how cool that King James Bible is. It's a lot cooler than those stupid phones. All right, again, you know, you young people, you know 13's got a funny connotation to it. You go into an elevator, even the elevators go from the 12th to the 14th floor. They don't, nobody likes 13. It's a spooky number. You want to know that. It's a bad number. But sometimes it can be a good number because rebellion can be good or bad. If you're in church tonight, you're rebelling against the devil and against your age bracket by putting God first. Most teenagers won't do that, so you're going upstream as a good rebel. Got 13 flag, uh, stars in that flag. 13 colonies rebel. That's how you got a country. But I want to show you something really cool about the number 13. Look at verse 1. In the beginning, what's the next word? All right, God created the heaven and the earth. That book sitting on your lap that you're looking at now, it's God's book. He wrote it. Why would you be shocked to see his name in the first verse, right? But put your seatbelt on and keep looking. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of, what's the next word? God moved upon the face of the waters. Verse 3, and what? God said, verse 4, and God saw. You all see that? Look at verse 5. And God called the light day. In the darkness he called night. Verse 6, look. And God said, verse 7. And God made, verse 8. And God called the firmament heaven. Verse 9, anybody seeing a pattern here yet? Verse 9, and God said, let the waters under the heaven. Verse 10, and God called the dry land earth. Verse 11, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass. Verse 12, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. See all that? Hey, young people, look at the next verse. Anybody smart enough to see what's different about that verse compared to the first 12 verses you read? Hello, look at the next verse. I'm back. The first time God disappears from the Bible, the first time, is the first time the number 13 pops up. Because it's, it's a bad number. First time sinner shows up. Exodus, Genesis, turn to Genesis 13 real quick. Preacher, these are the things that intrigue younger people. All the old people, they usually shot, amen. 
Young people are still hungry to see, see cool stuff. Look at Exodus, uh, Genesis 13. Now look at verse 13. Genesis 13, verse 13. Okay, now when we read this verse, you might want to count how many words are in the verse. And the men of Sodom were wicked and, what's the next word? Sinners before the Lord exceedingly. That's the first time the word sinner shows up in your Bible. How many words in that verse? Thirteen. And that's talking about sodomy, homosexuality. Not only just sinners, but sinners exceedingly. You all see that? Uh, you want to see a good, a good rebel? Turn to the, turn, hang a right all the way to the back. Some of you can't find these books right away. That's understandable. Pastor is probably struggling with a few of them. Say amen right there. Look at Hebrews. You ladies, you got a lazy husband? How many of you ladies got a lazy husband? Raise your hand. All right. All right. On a cold morning, he gives you the elbow and he says, get up and make some coffee. You tell him to read Hebrews. Amen right there. All right, look at Hebrews. Hebrews. Look at Hebrews 13, right? I want to show you a good rebel now. That's what you teenagers are doing tonight. You're being good rebels for God. Hebrews 13, what verse do you think we should look at? All right, probably the verse that's got 13 words in it again. Look at Hebrews 13, verse 13 with 13 words in it. Watch. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. He's kicked out of the camp, and if you're going to live for God, you'll get kicked out of the in crowd as well. Right. He's out there, you go out there with him. Right. Amen. See that thing? Now, let me show you something else. Uh, turn to John 14 real quick. I'll give you another verse for the teenagers tonight. The Lord's really moving around. I'm not used to being this led of the Lord. You know? I, I sh and if I, don't know, I, I should have studied more, preacher. I didn't know you'd have a good crowd like this. Look at John 12 real quick. John 12. See, why do you keep saying all those funny things up there? I'm trying to hold your attention. Zig Ziglar used to say, I'm like the, I'm like the cross-eyed javelin thrower. I'm not going to set any records, but I'll hold your attention for a while. Praise God. Look over here at John 12. Here's that story about the, uh, Jesus coming and being on the donkey. I told you it's covered in all four Gospels. Here's the account in John 12. You want to see something for teenagers in here? Look at verse 14. And Jesus, when he had found a, what? Young ass sat thereon. He's telling you that that little, that little baby donkey he was riding on was a young ass. What does that mean? That means it's very important to get saved when you're young. Yeah. Now, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Ecclesiastes says, now let me tell you something about these teenagers here, okay, and the youth department. Somebody's doing the job right. Are you the youth director? Have mercy. <laughs> um, okay, let me, let me show you something cool. You can't get all these stories together in the Bible yet because you're just starting out. So you listen to I'll tell you things. In Matthew 20, there's a parable Jesus told about people that got hired all day long. Uh, five different times they got hired to go out in the field and work. Six o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock, twelve o'clock, three o'clock, five o'clock. Work day ends at six. Everybody at the, end of the, at the end of the day got a penny. The people that worked all day complained that the people at the end of the line, they got hired. COVID. Where did it? America needs me, bro. People that got uh, hired at the end of the day, you know, I, 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 they, know they, they only worked an hour, and they got the same thing. I got paid for working all day. That's, that's how that's... Good night, the morning. I got to get out of here. Now, this is really cool if you'll get this. If you go over and look at Matthew 20, if I ever preach for a youth group, a youth revival, this is the, the chapter I'll always preach on because it's so cool. If you'll go back and look at it later in Matthew 20, the crowd that got hired at 6 o'clock in the morning, that's a picture of, the, the whole story is a picture of when people get saved and go to work for the Lord. If you get saved at 6 o'clock in the morning, that's a young person. I got saved when I was 21. I got hired about, you know, maybe 9.30, quarter to 10. Somebody gets saved, and you know, your grandpa, 60, 70 years old, they're getting in at the last minute, about 5 o'clock. You get the idea? Now, you know what's one of the coolest things in that chapter? I've been saved 50 years. I've never heard one person preach on what I'm telling you. Go look at what it says. It said when 
The first group, the first group at 6 o'clock in the morning, it said when they had agreed on a penny, they went, they went into work. When they agreed on a penny. Go look at the crowd that's hired at 9 o'clock and 11, I mean 12, 3 and 5, the other four groups. It said, that which is right I'll give to you. That's what the boss said. Okay. And they went to work with no idea what they were going to get paid. The only folks that knew what they were going to get was the crowd that got hired in the morning. When they had agreed on a penny. You know what the key word for that is? Negotiations. Basketball player coming out of college, everybody's after him. Different teams are off and that kid, all kind of things. He's going like this, look. There's the one negotiator trying to get you to live for God. The devil's over here trying to get you to live for him. And you're going back and forth listening. And finally you say, okay, I think you, you sound like you got a good deal. I think I'll listen to you for a while. But you get folks like us that got saved coming out of the world. How many of you men were saved later in life? Raise your hand. You know, what, you know what a good deal you got when you got saved. You didn't have to ask what the pay was. I'm just glad to have a job with Jesus. Because yeah, I know how wicked the world is. You don't know anything yet. That's why the devil can con you. You're very smart for listening to him. No matter how he looks. Amen right there. No, Jack, Jack, Jack House taught us if you don't make fun of people, you don't love them. Amen. And by the way, if you can't laugh at yourself, somebody else will. All right, now listen, neighbor. I'm, uh, bottom line, in order to get saved, you know, in order to get saved, you've got to be willing to admit what you are, a rebellious jackass that's bound, got to get loosed. People, the flesh doesn't want to acknowledge that. But I've got a lot of other points in here, but I want to get out of here by 8 o'clock. So I want to get to the main part of the message, okay? The main part of the message is, uh, and by the way, you can go back to Matthew 21 real quick. I've got to drive four hours uh, tonight when I get out of here. Although I'd like to stay here all, with you a long time. You've got a Wednesday night schedule. You've got to be out by close to eight. Um, I want to show you something else funny here. Look over at, um, look over at verse 7. I like it. And he brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes. You know, if you're going to have the Lord ride on you, you might want to have some clothes on. Yes, sir. Say, it don't matter what, what the outside looks like. It sure does. Yes, sir. Just want you to see that. Yes, all right. Now, look, there's all kinds of different things. I, could, I, got, I got pages of notes I'm scratching over right here. Hey, here's, here's something. I ought to hit this real quick. Everybody's yelling, when Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, this is a week before he's going to die. And uh, he's riding in, and everybody's yelling, Hosanna, praise the Lord. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. They're all yelling that. Listen, one week later, the same crowd's yelling, Crucify him! Right. Now look, you teenagers, it's okay now to get excited now and trying to serve the Lord now. What are you going to do next month? What are you going to be doing next year? When, when excitement wears off, or the preacher doesn't make you... You know, you know, let you down, disappoint you maybe. Somebody gossips about you. What are you going to do, bomb out? The hardest thing, I've been saved 50 years, I told you. This is a big year for me. The hardest thing I've had, I told you, the most important thing was a sense of purpose. I've got a reason for living. Keeps me busy. Keeps me young thinking. I'm 71 stinking years old. I'm telling you all these silly jokes. I got two books on that table, two that are 900 pages. How many people can write a 900-page book and tell you why Tony is the number one Italian name in America? You understand that? You know Tony is the number one Italian name, right? You know why that is? Because when they're putting them on the boats in Italy, they send them to America, they're stamping them on their heads. To New York. To New York. All right. I, I got a purpose. I'm happy. The number one thing in, the, in your Christian life is having a reason to be alive, doing something for the Lord. I'm carrying the Lord around. He's on my back by, by way of being inside my heart. Right. Yes, sir. But the number one heartache I've had in 50 years of all the trials you'll go through, number one, number one, betrayals. Yes, sir. Anybody ever stab you in the back? 
How about, don't, don't pass out when I ask you this question. How many times it comes from your own family? That's the craziest thing. A man's foes shall become they of his own household. I have, my wife and I have two great-grandchildren. We saw the one at my son's funeral and the great-grandson and the great-granddaughter's been born. We've never seen her because they're both illegitimate. My oldest grandchild's, you know, in the shack-up relationship. The only thing worse than that is the Bible verses they put on Facebook all the time. This is a crazy day we're living in, man. So-called saved people are going in a hundred directions doing their own thing. And the preachers are dealing with it just like you normal human beings are. All right, now look, there's too much liberty in the room here. You know what that means, liberty? It's too easy to pre keep preaching it because these young people look like they're all in trouble because they're staring at me. In, in a normal church service, young people don't do that. They're on the stinking phones. These girls back here look like ready scribes taking notes. All right, now watch. I want to get to the main thing, then I want to say, thing, and we'll get out of here. I want you to look at that amazing verse in verse 10. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, right? Saying, what's the next three words? Who is this? You know, you can ask that question three different ways by emphasizing any of those three words individually. Look, who is this? Who is this? Who is this? You ever get a text from somebody on the phone? They don't sign their name. They just think you got every phone number in the history of the world memorized. <laughs> what do you do? You send, them a, you send them a text. Who is this? What a question. In 2009, the National Championship, Bowl Championship Series game between Florida State and Oklahoma, Tim Tebow put John 3.16 on his eye, black. Listen to this. And he's, he's a little wishy-washy. I think the other day he went to see the Pope or something. He doesn't know any better. He's, he's a wishy-washy kind of guy. But he's, he's a sincere guy in many ways as well. More naive probably than evil, corrupt. Look. But listen to this. He put John 3.16 on his eye, black. During the game, 90 million Americans... Google John 3.16 to see what that meant. In Christian America. I live in East Tennessee. I was in East Germany for 10 days. Big difference between East Germany and East Tennessee. In, East Ten in Tennessee, there's more Baptists than people. Just like Georgia. But I'm telling you, neighbor, that was 2009. That's several years ago. 90 million people didn't know what John 3.16 meant. What a shock that America has become so pagan. You know what they were saying when they got on Google? They said it was the number one, number one uh, trend, uh, topic trending on Facebook and Twitter that whole week. You know what they were saying? Who is this? But sadly, that ignorance that was shown to Jesus when he came into Jerusalem wasn't anything new. It started with his arrival on the planet Earth. I love this song, preacher, in Christmas time. You only hear it in the South. You never hear this up north. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. You ever sing that song down in the South? In a little town called Bethlehem, so many years ago, they told him there was no room in the inn. They had no way of knowing who they had turned away, the Lamb of God who would take away their sins. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. You ever sing that? I'm glad I know who Jesus is. He's more than just a story. He is the King of glory. I know. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. So many people still today don't know who Jesus is. That's why you need to get these books out to them. They've never felt his peace within their soul. But I want my life to show them how his love can set them free. He's the only one who can cleanse and make men free. Teenagers, don't be five, don't, not for five seconds be ashamed of what you believe in this room, building here. When you get out there, what's that stupid idiot woman's name? Uh, not Hillary Clinton. 
not Michelle Obama. The ones that got all the flaky followers. That's stupid. Who? No, the, the singer. Yeah, Taylor Swift. Don't, don't, don't. Why would you get impressed with Taylor Swift? She didn't come into this world. She, she didn't enter this world, watch it, through a sealed womb and then leave the world through a sealed tomb? Say amen right there. That womb, that, womb, that womb couldn't keep Jesus out and the tomb couldn't keep him in. You got a supernatural religion, neighbor. Don't be ashamed of that. Now listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to answer the question. Can I do that? Here's the main thing I want to leave you with and then we're going to blow out of here. Who is this? In Tennessee, everybody says, I'm a telling you, neighbor. I'm trying to become a southerner. Say amen right there. I'm a telling you, neighbor. You know the difference between Yankees and southerners. I've told you this forever. A southerner can be patting you on the back while he's planning your funeral. Bless your heart. They don't call the deep south for nothing. And a Yankee can walk into a cancer ward and say, what's eating you, bub? All right? But I want to be a southerner because I live in Tennessee. So I'm a telling you, neighbor, can I answer the question and we'll go home? Can we answer the question? Can I be a blessing to somebody tonight? All you young people here tonight, you get saved? You got saved by trusting Jesus. He's the one who saved you. Can I, t can I tell you a little bit about him this, this evening? Who is he? He's the virgin-born son of God. He's the blessed and only potentate. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's alpha and omega. He's the great I am that I am. He's the ancient of days. He's the beginning of the creation of God. He's the express image of His person. He's the one who fills eternity. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He's Shiloh. He is the one mediator between God and men, as well as God Himself. He's Emmanuel, which means God with us. Who is this? Why, well, He's wonderful counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's the son of David. He's the root of David. He's the root out of a dry ground. He's a tender plant. He's the good shepherd who giveth his life for the sheep. He's the door to the sheepfold. He's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He's a lamb as it had been slain. Who is this? He's the light of the world. He's the brightness of the Father's glory. He's the bright and the morning star. He's the star of wonder. He's the star of Jacob. He's a light to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. He's the desire of all nations. He's the polished shaft. He's, the, he's glorious in holiness. He's the glory of Israel. Who is this? I'm getting tired of that question, neighbor. He's the stone cut out without hands, the chief cornerstone, the sure foundation, the stone which the builders rejected, the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. <clears throat> He's the rock of ages. He's the rock of Horb. He's the rock that is higher than I. He's the water from the rock. He's the water of life. He's the fountain of life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Who is this? He's the seed of the woman. That's who he is. He's the only begotten of the Father. He is both the babe in the manger and the Word of God. He's the carpenter's son who created the universe. He's the manifold wisdom of God. He's the angel of Jehovah. He's the great physician. He's the bomb of Gilead. Who is this? He's the man of sorrows. He's the lonely Nazarene. By the way, young people, he's waiting to talk to you. You wake up in the morning, he's never been asleep. He that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. He's just waiting for your eyes to open up. Look. And as soon as your eyes open up, you can't wait to hear from you. You know what we normally do? Reach out for our stupid phone. I wonder if I got any more likes from my video I posted last night of the duck pushing a beach ball down the, 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 the shoreline. Oh, six likes. I no more. I'm going to commit suicide. He's waiting to talk to you. You ever have the Lord's Supper? As often as you do it. Do it in remembrance of me. <laughs> Look, the God who created the universe is afraid you might forget who he is. Please do it in remembrance of me. 
I think David said, when I consider the sun and the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man? Thou art mindful of him even. You care about us down here? Well, sure he does, because he made you special. So you can communicate with him. That will change your life if you get that. You... Who is this? He's the man of sorrows, the lonely Nazarene, the suffering servant, the accursed of God, a worm and no man. He's the brazen serpent. He's the brazen altar. He's the scapegoat. He's a better sacrifice. He's the ram in the thicket. He's the torn veil. Who is this? He's the corn of wheat. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the first fruits from the dead. He's the end of the law for righteousness. He's the mediator of a better covenant, the mercy seat, the manna which came down from heaven, the bread of life. The sm you young people are saying, where's all that stuff in there? It's in that, it's in that book, 1,300 pages. There's a lot in there about that lovely Lord that saved you. If you are saved, you ought to want to know something about him. Amen. He's the bread of life, small round thing, horn of salvation, savior of the world, our city of refuge. He's our Redeemer, Tree of Life, our Justification and Propitiation, Friend of Sinners, Mighty to Save. You won't get this on TikTok, by the way. Friend that sticketh closer than a brother, the Captain of our Salvation, the Author and the Finisher of our Faith, the Last Adam. Who is this? Good night, man. He's the Rose of Sharon, the Lily of the Valley, the Fragrance of Cassia, the Diadem of Beauty, the Chiefest among 10,000, the True Vine, the Pearl of Great Price, Rabboni, the peace of God that passeth all understanding, the bishop of our soul, the anchor of our soul, our table of showbread, the ascended advocate, our faithful high priest, the head of the church, which is his body, our kinsman redeemer, our bridegroom, my beloved. Who is this? What, are you crazy to keep asking that question? Why, he's holy, holy, holy. He's that holy thing. He's the high and lifted up one. He's the heir of all things. He's Lord of the Sabbath. He's Lord of the whole earth. He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's a man of war. He's captain of the Lord's host. He's mighty in battle. He's the mighty God. He's the governor among nations. He's the Prince of life, King of glory, King eternal, Son of righteousness, Judge of the universe, Judge of the quick and the dead, the consolation of Israel. Who is this? Well, he's the music of our soul. He's the one who sends streams in the valley and a song in the night. And I know that. Last August, I was in Hookset, New Hampshire, and went and visited my mother's grave. Two weeks later, I was in Calico Rock, Arkansas, to visit my son's grave. TikTok and Facebook can't help you when you're standing at the grave of your son. He's our amazing grace, our blessed assurance, our mighty fortress, our haven of rest. He's the shelter in the time of storm. He's our cleansing wave, all that thrills our soul. The fount of every blessing, honey from the rock, shepherd of love, our majestic sweetness, the one who paid it all. He's the wonder of it all. Who is this? He's the one who monitors sparrows. I spent 10 days in Dresden and Leipzig, Germany, just two weeks ago, Martin Luther country. I told those Germans there in the church, Martin Luther used to call... Sparrows, God's little theologians. Every time you'd see one fly by, remember, he can't fall out of the tree without God knowing about it. He's the one who baffled the doctors in the temple, who mocked the Pharisees, who intimidated Herod, who rescued an adulteress, who played with children, who wept over Jerusalem, who turned water into wine, who walked on the water, who calmed the storms with his word, who opened blind eyes and deaf ears, who cured the lame and the insane. Hello, hello, neighbor, who fed 9,000 people with a dozen loaves and a few fishes, who cleansed the lepers and cast out demons, who noted the widow's might, who snubbed Pilate, who forgave the dying thief, who defied the grim reaper, and who didn't leave the tomb till he folded his grave clothes. Who is this, you say? Why, well, he's the sole inspiration for a million unexplainable phenomenon. How about this? Thousands of hymn books with hundreds of thousands of hymns written about a dead man. That's what CNN thinks. 
Hey, the one who inspired 50 million martyrs over the past 2,000 years. <laughs> You'll like this one. He's the one who inspires. Watch it. Don't get mad at me. I'm not trying to be ugly, like they say in North Carolina. He he's the one who inspires. Watch it. Millions of simple folk, like you and me, who assemble three times a week so a man can yell at them out of a black book with no pictures in it. Explain that, neighbor. He's the one who inspires millions of transformed and happy lives. <clears throat> Thousands of rescue missions, reclaiming ruined lives without drugs or therapy. He's the one who inspires hundreds of thousands of foreign missionaries circling the globe. Watch it. Scoffing material pleasures. You don't know this in modern America, but in the 1800s when missionaries left America or left England for third world countries, they bought one-way tickets on the steamers. They weren't coming to them. And guess what they used for a suitcase or a trunk? They used coffins. That's what they used for suitcases, caskets, that they were going to bury themselves in. He's the one that inspires the convicting power of God at sick beds, tragedies, funeral homes, and cemeteries. An atheist one time said to John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist denomination, Mr. Wesley, your followers are a little too emotional. You know, in the olden days down here, shouting Methodists, jumping over the pews in the old days. Your followers are a little too emotional, Mr. Wesley. You know what he said? He said, you're probably right. But they die well. <laughs> and believe it or not, there was a time when he was the key to the calendar. Who is this? Last, last year I was preaching in Philadelphia where Brother Stroud is this, tonight. And I got saved out there and I, and I, I went over, 50 years ago I went to a, a grocery store where I used to pass out Christmas cards. I got saved in uh, August, baptized on Christmas Eve that same year. And I went out there passing out Christmas cards, preacher. You know what I was passing out? The most beautiful thing I ever read. <clears throat> it's called One Solitary Life. You ever heard this? I heard it 50 years ago. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village. We worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held office. He never owned a home. He never went to college. He never set foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He had nothing to do with this world except the naked power of his divine manhood. While he was still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends deserted him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property that he had, his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today he is the centerpiece for much of the human race. All the armies that have ever marched and all the navies that have ever sailed and all the parliaments that have ever sat, and all the kings that have ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. I'm closing, neighbor. Let me break it down for you now. Are you young people still listening? Are you girls still listening? Some of you are not saved yet, probably. That doesn't mean you can't get saved. You're in the best place that you can get saved in. So let me, let me break it down now, all right? Ready? Who is this? He's the answer to life's question. That's who he is. He's the solution to your problem. Hey, young people, you got problems in your house? Mom and dad divorced, dead. My mother killed herself right in front of me. 
when I was 11. God can cheer your life up if you let him. He's the remedy for your soul. He's the escape hatch in your sinking ship. He's the missing piece in your puzzle. He's the way out of your jungle. He's the end of your nightmare. He's the purpose for your existence. He's the fulfillment to your expectations. He's the one who came to, to you and brought you out. Remember that donkey deal? Bring him to me. There's your donkeys right here. Or here's your servants trying to get you to come to Jesus. Anybody home? He's the one who cannot fail. He's the only one who's able to deliver thee. To sum it up, he's the altogether lovely one. That's who he is. And preacher, listen to me. That's my 190th point. Two minutes to eight, and I just covered 190 points. Three points in a poem, not Brother Grady. He's got 190 points and no poem. Oh, one more point. In closing, the best news of all. Who is this? Here's the best news of the whole list. Ready? He's the one who promised in Matthew 18, 20, wherever two or three would be gathered together in my name, there will I be in the midst of them. What a wonderful privilege. Ready, neighbor? To have that same king who rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago, have him here in our very midst yes, this evening. Yes, Can you sense his presence tonight? All we did was brag on him. You don't think he's right enjoying it all? Can you feel his presence? Let me ask you all a question. Ready? Are you willing to let the king ride upon you wherever he wants to go? That's the whole purpose. The master hath need of thee. He wants you to take him places. Now, if you're already saved, let me ask you something else. You're not taking him to the wrong places, places that he doesn't want to go, are you? All right, I'm all done. Preacher, I think I should get a double love offering. I'm, I'm ending right on the nose. Glory to God and the Lamb. Let me tell you this. Look, last paper and I'm done. There's a story told about an elderly Christian widow lady whose advanced age began to affect her memory. She had always been known for having memorized much of the Bible. However, eventually she could come down only remembering one Bible verse. I know in whom I have believed. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. But as the weeks went by, the verse kept getting shorter and shorter until all that she could remember was, that which I have committed unto him. Finally, as she crossed over, all she could remember and was heard muttering was, him, him. Him. She lost her entire Bible, but for one word. Yet she had the whole Bible in one word. Him. 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 Do you know Him today? Do you love Him today? Are you glad that you know who Jesus is? I am. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Let's stand to our feet. Maybe if somebody plays the piano, I don't know what you do on Wednesday, but there's so much liberty in this room, it's hard, hard to deal with it. It's such a blessing. I'm going to have a little prayer. When I, finish, when I finish praying, somebody can play the piano. But you know, when I preach this, anytime I preach it, it seems like a lot more people want to use the altar than normally do, just to tell the Lord how much they love Him. And to tell them how glad they are that they know who he is. And they're not the 90 million Americans. Who, what does John 3.16 mean? Do you know him today? You realize how privileged you are if you do? Does anybody here today say, Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved tonight? Sure sounded good to hear all that. But either I know that I'm not saved yet or I'm not sure that I am. But I sure feel good inside. And I think the Lord is speaking to me tonight about getting saved. Would you pray for me, Brother Grady, maybe, that I could get saved like these others tonight? Would you lift your hand nice and high if that's you? 
Is anybody here? Got a lot of liberty in the room. Anybody? All right. Everybody glad they know who Jesus is? All right. Listen, this is a good church. I, I've been here before. You don't have to beat people in the head to get them to use an altar in this kind of church. But I'm going to say a little prayer, and then the invitation will start. And if God spoke to you in a special way, and you just want to tell the Lord how much you love Him tonight, maybe. You don't have to come to the altar to do that. But maybe you want to. Maybe you'd like to. The invitation's for you. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for being so good to us. And thank you for letting us know who you are. Thank you that we don't have to say, who is this? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed. The piano's playing. And you, you respond as you feel like you want to tonight. And we'll be out of here in just a couple of moments. the world and destroy your life he's been pretty good to you hadn't he hope you love him this morning or this evening you folks have been saved a while you know what I'm talking about tonight how good is he that new book I've got we dedicated it to my son I got his picture in there and everything you know I was down in Houston Texas a couple back in January and the Lord spoke to me there he said, you got a new book coming out to get people saved, right? He said, you just lost your son, didn't you? Well, you didn't lose him, you know. And then you know what he said to my heart? I hope this ain't too private to tell you. You know what he said? He said, I, I gave up my son. I gave up my son so sinners could be saved. I think that's what John 3.16 says. You got a Bible verse that talks about entering into the fellowship of his suffering. You know what that means? You get to endure something that he did. That's a privilege, neighbor. Better be thankful for a good church like this and a good preacher and preacher's wife and some mature men in this church and ladies have been here a long time. Boy, God's been good to you. I don't know everything, but I've been in 400 churches in four years. I know a good church when I see one. 